Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm Joe Carr. We're happy to bring you an encore presentation of a summer 2020 interview with Brian Burke. Brian is one of many PC alumni who has carved out a successful career as a sports executive, in his case, as a Stanley Cup winning NHL general manager. A few things have changed since this interview, so let's catch up. First of all, the NHL was able to navigate multiple challenges and complete the 2020-2021 regular season. The Stanley Cup playoffs are down to four semifinalists, and fans are back in the arenas. Partway through the season, Brian took over as president of hockey operations for the Pittsburgh Penguins. From that point on, Pittsburgh was one of the NHL's best teams and went on to win their division. He has also taken his work as an advocate for the LGBTQ plus community to his new city. Click the link in the show notes for an NHL.com story about Brian's participation in the June 5th Pittsburgh Pride Revolution March. One more quick thing, we talked a lot about Burke's Law, Brian's memoir that was just about to hit the bookstores last summer. It's widely available now, and I can't recommend it strongly enough, especially for Friar hockey fans. One friar grade after another gets mentioned in one of the long list of rollicking hockey stories Brian shares. His PC coach, Lou Lamarillo, is, no surprise, one of the central figures in the book. Thanks again for joining us. Here's our conversation with Brian Burke. Our guest today is longtime player, agent, professional hockey executive, and commentator Brian Burke, a member of PC's class of 1977. Thanks for joining us today, Brian, from your home in Toronto. My pleasure, Joe. Thank you for having me on. Good to see you. So a life in hockey, and I bet you've never seen anything like this. Training camps underway in July, a couple of weeks from NHL games. Are you optimistic about the NHL's plan here? Yes, I think it'll work. I think the key is the next eight or nine days to get from the, the training camp sites into the bubble, the two bubbles. I think once they get to the bubble, I think they'll be able to keep them safe and isolated. And I think the plan is excellent. The players need to be very disciplined right now, though, between now and then. Do you have any particular concerns when you look at the plan? Does anything jump out at you as problematical? No, I I think the issue is the next, like I say, the next, we got nine days left, I think, till the players go. We got six practices left in a preseason game, uh, an exhibition game, and then they go to the bubble and that, I think once they get to Toronto and Edmonton, the league will be able to maintain real good security around them. The key now is, so a player finishes practice now with the Boston Bruins, he's got to go right back to the hotel if he's a young kid, or he's got to go right home if he's a veteran. They can't stop at Dunkin' Donuts and get a coffee. They can't stop and have a few beers at the pub on the way home like you know players have always done. So uh, if they're disciplined now, once they get to Toronto and Edmonton, I think we'll be all right. It's really going to be a sprint, sort of a 24-team playoff. What do you expect in in terms of quality of play? Well, the the feedback from around the league has been that the training camps have been excellent. The energy has been good. Um, I I worry about such a short training camp that you'll have some groin and muscle injuries, and there's been a few of those. Um, But the, the fine line is to get right back into game tempo in 14 days or less. Uh, without pushing too hard. So from what I hear, teams have used different approaches, different days off, scrimmage versus non-scrimmage, drills versus other, you know, battle drills. Um, So there's a lot of different theories going into how they're preparing, but it sounds like everyone's off to a good start. I texted a few players. They all say camp's great so far. They're they're happy. One of the things that's going to be so strange for those of us who love to watch the game and and feel the emotion that comes from the crowd will be, playing in empty arenas, well, how will that affect play? Well, I think we're, we're all used to playing in front of small crowds at one point in our lives. When you played outside as a kid, there was no one watching. And even, uh, you know, even some of the college games that I played, we had very small crowds uh, at home and sometimes on the road. Um, in the American League, if you went into Binghamton on a Tuesday night, there wasn't a very big crowd there. So I think, I think players are more accustomed to it than they – than they think. They've done it before. Uh, I think it's going to be strange, but I think they'll get over that right away because when you're playing, you tune all that out anyway. You don't hear the crowd. You don't pay any attention to that. So I think it's, uh, I think we'll get some good audio of the players talking to one another and probably not all family specific or appropriate, but 
But uh, I think we'll get some good sound bites out of it from the officials and the players. I think it'll be good. Sounds like fun. Will you be involved in the broadcast? Yeah, we just I just got my schedule. We're doing uh, – some days we're doing as many as three games, so it's going to be some long days in the studio. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's been four months, and we've been working a lot on radio with guests. And, and now to talk about games and talk about the first period, uh, I'm really excited. So I start on uh, on the first. I've got two games that day. Oh, can't wait. That sounds like fun. Let's uh, talk about your journey to Providence College. So you're born in Providence, but grew up in Edina, Minnesota, and then made your way back to Providence. How did that all come about? Well, my dad, uh, my dad worked for Sunbeam Appliances, a company that's still around today. And he kept getting promoted. He made it up to vice president, and they kept moving him. So I'm one of 10 kids. My mom and dad first went to St. Louis. Then my dad got promoted. They went to Milwaukee and had the first two kids, then Providence, and had me and my brother, John. I was actually born at Lying in Hospital, which is only about a thousand yards away from the campus. And I remember telling my mom that when uh, when I first got to school, I said, "Ma, you know, you have me right here. It's right beside the school, right down on Smith Street." So um, we moved to Minnesota when I was 12, and I started playing hockey that next year. And then uh, Bob O'Connor was a, was a famous Minnesota coach, and he played with Lou, and he uh, he talked Lou into recruiting me, and we had a we had a pretty good pipeline from Minnesota there for a while with Pablo Cano there. That's an, uh, an amazing story, isn't it? When you think about it in the context of the way things are done and how so many Minnesota players, you were followed by John Sullivan, then you had Scott and Kurt Kleinendorst and Steve Anderson, and Bruce Rabot, and the list and Noel Catterall. But Coach Lamarillo didn't really have to go to Minnesota because he had a guy there taking, you know, finding the players for him. Yeah, and it was a real good pipeline for a long time. And Bob O'Connor is the reason I started playing hockey. He encouraged me and I moved to Minnesota. I didn't start playing until I was 13, but Bob was my first coach, and uh, he was great to me. He's very influential in my life. He and Lou Lamarillo, if if I remember correctly, were were they line mates? They were teammates anyway, right? Teammates, I, I think, for one year because Lou was a very young freshman. Lou was like a 17-year-old freshman, and Bob O'Connor was a Marine Corps veteran. I think Bob was 22 or 23 when he played with Lou. who was 17, but. Uh, Coach Lamarello told me a great story. They were playing at New Hampshire, and Lou was the right wing, and the fans, there was, they were outside back then. They played outside, and the fans were, a couple of them punched Lou, and were taking swings at him. He didn't know what to do. He was a sophomore. He couldn't play as a freshman back then. And so Bob O'Connor said, you play center. And Bob went right down the side of the rink and speared like 10 people, got them all back off the boards. He said, all right, now go back to the wing. <laughs> Problem solved. Yes. That's, that's a good teammate right there. Self help back in the day. That's for sure. So uh, that's probably Snively Arena, right? At UNH in the old days or yeah. someplace like that. Um, how much of an influence on you was Lou Lamarillo? Well, I was at Providence from 1973 to 1977. And I say this in my book, so this will be, it's already been written down. The most important four years of my life, the most influential four years of my life because I was a pretty green kid, right? I, I was a new, pretty young as a hockey player. It, only, it was my, my sixth year of organized hockey. I walked down and made the team at Providence College. So Lou took me from being this green kid to being a full-grown man and signing with the Philadelphia Flyers and going to law school at his insistence. Um, so, yeah, Lou was a huge influence on me. I could never repay Lou the debt that I owe him. Obviously, a successful college coach and administrator, the driving force behind the formation of Hockey East, but a legendary pro executive, professional hockey executive. What is it about Lou Amarillo that has made him so successful in those roles at the professional level? Well, I think Providence College, a, a small little school, has produced four NHL general managers. Pretty impressive. Lou, John Ferguson, Jr., uh, now Fitzy, and um, and me. And, and so I think with Lou, it's – the same things that made him successful in everything he's done in his life. He was a top baseball player at Providence College. He was a star, a uh, star hockey player, uh, excellent student, um, successful baseball manager in the Cape Cod League. I think it's he has integrity. He outworks you. He outprepares you. Um, uh, the same things that have made him successful at every level have, have translated very well in pro sports. Two of you have won Stanley Cups, you and Lou Amarillo. Yeah. Either of the other two won, won a cup? I can't remember. Sorry? 
Have either of the other two friars who became GMs won the cup? I can't uh, Fitzy, Fitzy is a player, but no, I don't think so. Okay. Not, not in management, not yet. Doing pretty well. What was that like? What kind of a thrill was it to win the Stanley Cup with the Ducks? Well, it, it's it's really hard to explain for people who don't work in sports. It's like climbing Mount Everest. I mean, it's what we get paid to do. It's what we dream about when we go to sleep at night. And there's, you know, 30 other GMs trying to beat you, so it's really challenging. Um, it requires an unbelievable amount of skill and some luck. And uh, But it's the, you know, that you finally get to hold the cup over your head, and it's like, okay, everything, all those early morning practices, all, all those trips across the country, all those scouting trips to Brandon, Manitoba, when it's minus 40, it's all worth it. Tonight, it's all worth it. Greatest trophy in sports by far, isn't it? I think so, yeah. So, um, let's talk a little bit, Brian, if you don't mind, about your academic experience at PC. Uh, you went to Harvard Law School, as you mentioned, so obviously you sort of epitomized the student athlete. How did Providence College prepare you for your career? Well, my first year, Ronnie Wilson and I were freshmen together. We both were straight-A students, or damn near, so we both opted to go into pre-med. Now, science and math are my weakest subjects by a mile. It was an act of appalling arrogance. And I was barely, barely eligible at the end of my first year. I did really well in Western Civ, and that was really what, what tipped the balance. But I, I barely passed um, advanced mathematics and chemistry. And so I switched into history my second year, which is my love and, and my strong suit as a student. And the history department of Providence was fantastic. I had great professors. And it just took off. You know, I was, uh, I think my last three years at Providence, I was like a three, eight, five or a three, nine, something. My, my junior year, I was a 4.0 both semesters. Um, so, um, I was thinking of, I wanted to go back to graduate school in history. And I wanted, I was thinking of going to Notre Dame because Dr. Sickinger, one of my professors who I thought was fantastic had gone there. And he said the, uh, the program was excellent. So, I talked to a couple other people. I talked to Dr. Mullen, um, talked to Professor Deasy, and uh, and they all said, yeah, Notre Dame would be a good place. So I wrote away. This is before the internet, of course. I wrote to Notre Dame and a couple other schools and imply, uh, inquired about applying for to get my master's in history. And then I wanted to go back and coach college hockey and teach. I just thought it would be a great lifestyle. So. Um, that was all in the works. I signed up to take the GREs. But Lou called me in when I was a senior. And actually, I, was, I used to run down. I lived in Joe's. So I used to run across that parking lot and then that soccer field. It's gone now, of course. And then um, right to the rink. And uh, Alana Mooney was Lou's EA, his assistant. And she came out and she saw me running across the field. And she said, Coach needs, needs to see you. So I'm like, Oh, you know, it's never good, right? Lou wants to see it or something. You did something wrong. And I was the captain. Ronnie and I were co-captains. So I'm thinking, well, I didn't. I never got in trouble. So maybe one of the freshmen got in trouble. So I go into Lou's office, and he had the LSAT application there, the law boards and uh, law school admissions test. And he shoved it across the, his desk. And he said, you're writing this exam. Uh, your professors tell me if you do well, you got a shot at going to Harvard or Yale. So I looked down and said, law school admissions test, I shoved it back. I said, I have no interest in going to law school, coach. And he shoved it back. He said, that was not a request. You're writing the exam. And he said, just, it, it could change your life. Just do it. Just humor me. And I said, I really don't want to go to law school. And he said, Brian, you're writing the exam. So I got to be late for practice on a Saturday, which you were never late for practice. But Lou said, go write the exam. So I did. I get it back. Um, I went on the ice. I was late, so I ran from Harkins Hall all the way to the rink and uh, put on my stuff and got out on the ice as quick as I could. And Lou said, how'd it go? I said, I, I have no idea. But I said, I have the worst headache I've ever had in my life. He said, get in line. He didn't care. Right? So I get the results back. It was a 704, 98th percentile in the world that year. And I, went, I took it down to the rink, and I left, put it back in the envelope. I made Lou take it out of the envelope and look at it. And he said, 704. And I said, keep reading. 98th percentile. So I applied to four law schools. I got into Harvard. I got into Georgetown. Um, the first school that came back, I'll never forget, was George Washington University. And that was my safety school, but I didn't get in. So I thought, oh, well, I better write the GREs after all. And then in the space of three days, I got, I got into Georgetown. 
I got into Harvard, and then I got my scored my only hat trick in four years of college hockey against the University <laughs> of New Hampshire. It all happened in three days. So, uh, yeah, all because of Lou. All because Lou took that interest, and I, I signed with the Flyers. They own my pro rights, so I deferred my admission for a year. Signed with the Flyers and played in the American League. We won a Calder Cup championship that year. And then I went back to law school. And all because Lou took an interest. Maine Mariners, the Calder Cup, right? The Maine Mariners, yeah. As, uh, up in Portland. It's, well, he knew what was right for you. So there, there we go. I would guess that a background in the law was probably was certainly useful in being an agent, for sure. But also, I imagine, in running an organization. And Well, you know, what, you, know what a law degree, you know what a law degree does, Joe, is it teaches you to think a certain way to solve problems. So your client sits down and your client says, I'm here today, tomorrow I want to be there. So it, it teaches you to problem solve and come up with pragmatic solutions to problems. It's a great, I'm glad I went to law school even if I had never practiced law because of the way it teaches you to think. So it was a hard three years. Three years at Harvard Law School was no fun. Uh, I didn't enjoy it. It's in the book. I said, if you're expecting a hymn to Harvard University, you won't find it here. <laughs> but it certainly was a game changer as far as uh, the rest of my career. So having that lottery has helped me get every job I ever got. The book Brian mentioned is his forthcoming memoir, which we want to talk about at length in just a minute, uh, because that's going to be terrific. But one uh, other subject, Brian, that I would like to, to talk about with you is the story related to your late son, Brendan, who died in a car accident at age, at age 21, 10 years ago, after coming out. And from the tragedy of that, of his death comes a story of great impact in sports, especially hockey. I'd like you to tell us about the You Can Play initiative and really about Brendan's impact and his legacy. Yeah, so Brendan came out, um, he was a student manager at the university, at Miami University. Uh, they used to call it Miami of Ohio, but now it's Miami University, the one in Oxford, Ohio, not the one in Miami. And um, he was a student manager there. The coach was Rico Blasi. And he came out to, uh, he had come out to his whole family uh, and some friends, but no one on the hockey team knew that he was gay. And uh, he decided to come out. And I said, you can't, you can't come out in the middle of the season if it's going to be a distraction for your team. You have to ask Coach Blasi. I said, I'm not embarrassed, Brendan. I will be there when you come out. I'll be there at the announcement. But I said, uh, you've got to ask Coach Blasi and make sure, and Rico Bozzi hugged him and said, no, you want to come out, come out, it'd be great. So he came out, and uh, it was a big deal. And after he passed away, um, our family, Patrick, more than I, uh, my son, um, started You Can Play. So You Can Play, the message was to young gay team athletes that if you can play, you can play, because the, the dropout rate's very high, particularly with male athletes in team sports. And it gets to a point where there's a homophobic, dressing room atmosphere and and the notion was if you can play you can play in other words if you can play if you're if you're good enough you can help our team win you can play you belong and it was a much broader message you know it's you're talking about a small number of gay athletes and team sports but the message is really to everyone in the lgbtq community you can contribute you are welcome here if you can contribute so i think it's it's really empowered a lot of young athletes i think it's really empowered a lot of young gay people. I, I got letters. I still get letters from people saying that you know your your son inspired me to come out, and uh, your son inspired me to uh, accept my son who came out. So I think Brendan changed a lot of lives. I know my dad before he passed away said he thought that's why Brendan was sent to this planet. So um, yeah, he's a great kid. Still miss him yeah. all, all the time. Oh, I bet you and your family have done so much and. and researching this a little bit i watched a video with you and patrick and so impressed with patrick brendan's older brother who said that brendan had a heart the size of a hockey rink what a, a great line but patrick really continues to be a real driving force here doesn't he yeah he's, he deserves a lot more credit than i do he's uh, he's done great things with you can play and they've been, they've partnered up with uh, the national hockey league they've partnered up with the national football league um it's, it's been, the reception has been terrific. So this year they canceled the Pride Parade here in Toronto, but Rick Mercer, who's a famous Canadian actor, author, uh, comic, uh, he and I and, and my daughter marched the, the parade route. It actually marched one block east of the parade route, right through the heart of the village, the, the LGBTQ section of Toronto. 
and, and crossing on the rainbow sidewalks and everything. We walked the parade route and just thought about Brendan. Well, certainly Brendan will be a part of your upcoming book, Burke's Law, A Life in Hockey. Tell us what inspired the book and, and when will we be able to read it, most importantly? Well, you can pre-order it now. I don't know how to, but you can go online and pre-order pre it now. I know a lot of people have texted me that they've already done it. It comes out October 13th. I mean, basically, it's the story of my 32 years working for teams and, and starts in the agent business. And I tell stories that I think people will find interesting about the agent business, about representing Brett Hall when he turned pro, about being a young assistant general manager in Vancouver, then a rookie GM in Hartford, then working at the league office, then going back to Vancouver as GM, then Anaheim won a cup, working in TV and the media, and stories about the, the behind the scenes stuff that happened in all those jobs. It's really a look inside the curtain or behind the curtain. If you're a hockey fan, I think you'll find it interesting. It was fun writing it. Stephen Brunt is the author that helped me, and he's a, he writes great sports books, and this one's, a, I think, going to be very popular. So all from memory, or did you keep notes as you went along, or is there anything that you were able to draw on? Yeah, what, well, what I did is, first off, um, my last year in Calgary, my workload fell off late in the season. It was clear to me that my boss was thinking at the end of the year we'd make a change, which we did. So I, first I did an outline. Um, if you're going to write a book, do an outline. Then I did chapters. And then I started writing down stories. So I did about 150 pages single-spaced and gave it to Stephen. He promptly threw it all away. He used it as a, an outline, but he didn't use any of my writing. He said I wrote like a lawyer. And um, I did keep notes. I, I did, uh, especially after 07 when we won the Cup, knew, knowing that I was probably going to write a book at some point, I did start to take some notes. And then what I've done – I've tried to get everything accurate, but you know, you go back 35 years for some of this stuff, and I'm sure there's stuff I got wrong. But I've gone back and checked on, before I did a section, before I wrote it in the book, I would send parts of the book to people who had been involved with me at that time and say, is this accurate? So I think I've got, you know, touch wood, I think I've got pretty good, uh, pretty good accurate information in there. There's some Really interesting stories, I think, that people will see, well, that's how it works behind the scenes of the pro sports team. So 12, 13 years in the making, then. You started thinking about it after winning the Cup, huh? Yeah, so, um, but I didn't really do much with it other than keep a diary. And, um, and like I say, I, I, I will apologize to anyone for anything I got wrong, but I, it was a, not for a lack of effort to get it right. So it's safe to say there, I think you referenced this earlier, some Providence College in this book? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, okay. I talk about playing for Lou, and I was a walk-on freshman, and um, I never forget what Lou told me my first week. He saw how hard I was working, and he said, okay, you want to make the team, here's what you have to do. It's in the book. And then my four years there, and I, when I weighed in at Providence College in 1973, I was 6'2", same height I am now, and I weighed 176 pounds. Like, I was skinny as a rail. And when I turned pro with the Flyers, I was the same height, 6'2", and I weighed 206 pounds. So in my four years of Providence, I put on 30 pounds of muscle, and that made obviously made a big difference in how I played. And, uh, again, Lou with the discipline and all uh, the coaching he gave me, and he taught us how to be men too. So I will never be able to repay Lou or Providence College. It was the most important four years of my life. I really felt – there was constant pressure on me as a student there to be better, to be a good person, to be polite, to be better. And I'm still very close friends with most of my, most of the guys that I was friends with at Providence. We're still friends. There's a consistent theme when we talk to people who played for Lou Lamarillo and, and there have been a few. Mike Leonard, of course, is one who's been a guest a few times with us. And it's just what you said. He changed our lives. So that's yeah, certainly something. I, was, I look back when I was a freshman I was so green, you know, from Minnesota. I, I thought everyone talked funny. I didn't understand some of the language. I didn't know what a packy was. That was a liquor store. <laughs> um, I didn't know what a frap was. Um, there was, you know, we called it pop. Everyone there called it soda. And they made fun of how we talked. And I had trouble understanding. Like, Jimmy, I'll tell you a story. My roommate my first year was Jim Parks, P-A-R-K-S, from New Jersey. Great guy. Still friends with him. And Lou called me and said, I, I room with John McMorrow, who was from Edina, and Lou called me and said, I have your roommate's name. His name is Jimmy Pox. Well, I wrote down P-O-X. And my mother, who's passed now too, 
but she was a nurse and she was like, that's a funny last name. That's, that's a weird last name. I thought he said Pox. It was Jimmy Parks. So our first week there, we were homesick and we couldn't understand the Boston or Rhode Island kids in, in, the, in the dorms. We couldn't really literally had trouble understanding them. And about a weekend, you got it, right? It's no big deal. But um, yeah, Lou was, I was this green kid and Lou turned me into a, a very serious student, a very serious hockey player. Um, and I think, you know, taught us the right values as far as the value of hard work, the value of good friendships, the value of telling the truth, the value of having integrity. All those lessons that Lou taught us, I think, it's helped us all. Uh, by the way, we'll figure out that uh, issue of how to pre-order the book, Brian, and we'll put it in the show notes so that uh, okay, people can follow that, follow that link. Uh, it looks like it'll be great. When you started to conceptualize this book in terms of a series of what I expect are mostly rip-roaring stories, what's the first one that came to mind? What would you say, oh, I've got to get this in the book? Well, the story I tell is the only story I tell about high school sports is that, that – uh, we had a big problem on our football team when I was in high school and four guys skipped practice to go hunting and the coach had promised us a day off and, and he kicked them off the team. Right? They, they said, well, you promised us a day off if we won and it split our team right down the middle. And I remember thinking that was my first lesson on you've got to be frank and honest with your players. You have to, you got to keep your word with your players. So if I think you talk to any player that played for me in the whole 32 years, They'll say, Brian always told us the truth. He always had our back. He cared about us. All stuff I learned from Lou. Like Lou, he went to Lou and said, how come I'm not playing more? He'd say, because you suck. You know, right now you're terrible. And then he'd give you some tools. He'd say, well, here's what you have to do to get better. But he was never mean, but he was always brutally candid. And, you know, like just, he was, you know, it wasn't pleasant playing for Lou, but it was, it was great. And, um, Everyone graduated. Every single guy I played with graduated because Lou made them. And um, no other school can say that, that they're one of their top athletic teams that had 100% graduation rate. Nowhere, nowhere. I'd like to get your insights, Brian, on college hockey as it's played today, especially with respect to how it prepares the elite players for the professional game. What do you, what do you think of the way, way college hockey is played in 2020? Well, there's been a, a fundamental shift. First off, the face mask has really changed the way the game is played. It's made it hard for NHL teams to figure out who's going to still play tough when that face mask comes off. Um, I think the number of games, uh, they play way more than we played. They play up to 40 games, 38 games. We never played that many. I think we played 28 my, was the most one year, I think. So I think it's good. Um, the one thing that's changed is, when I was a freshman, I was a true freshman. I was 18. So was Ronnie Wilson. So was John McMorrow. Now most of your freshmen are 19 or 20. So they, they pushed the year back. So we're getting these guys in the NHL a year or two or three later. And it's not uncommon now for them to commit to a scholarship to a 17-year-old and tell them you got to play the next two years in the United States Hockey League in Sioux City for two years, and then we've got a spot for you. So that's the one negative I'd say is they pushed the timing back but the players we get from college hockey now are astoundingly better. Like, there's no way I could play a Providence College today. Even in my senior year when I had my was at my best as a player, I would have a hard time making the team at Providence that. I don't think I'd make it at all. And if I did, I'd be hanging on by my fingernails. So they, they've, they've turned it into – and you look at a lot of schools that never produce players are producing players now, like Ivy League schools and Mercyhurst has players now and – you know, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. So it, it's it's really grown. Penn State came in as a D1 program a few years ago. Arizona State University came in as a D1. Uh, University of Alabama Huntsville continues to survive. So it's actually, the game has actually grown, which for a non-revenue sport is very unusual. I, I love the way the game is played now. And yeah. one of the things that this relates to what you just described is the depth the fourth line guys yeah. and every, and, and, and really good players. And correspondingly, and PC was a leader in this, the, the rise of women's college hockey and, and national team hockey has been phenomenal. That, and that shouldn't be overlooked because the Providence was an early powerhouse in women's hockey. Along similar lines, we're awfully proud of what we see here at uh, Schneider Arena these days, the great program under – Coach Nate Lehman, certainly as an executive, uh, you've been watching his teams play for a long time and assessing 
the, the kinds of players that he brings into his program and the way he develops them. Your thoughts on, on Nate Lehman and the work he does? Well, I think Nate Lehman's done a terrific job, not just the national title, which obviously we're all very proud of, but consistently good teams that play an entertaining game. Like he, the way they play is the way they're going to be expected to play as professional athletes. And there's a lot of teams that don't do that. They play real, very, you know, trap oriented defensive hockey and Nate lets these kids play and lets them develop their offensive skills. I think he's done a great job. I think he's a good guy too. I really like him. It's really a source of pride around here these days too, because, you know, year in and year out, these are excellent teams and people really enjoy watching them play and they're in the yeah. community, they're good and, students and, and the whole thing. And the graduation rate's still right where it should be. The GPA is right where it should be. He hasn't taken his foot off the gas at all on the academic side. And, uh, He's done a real nice job. That was a good hire. So 2015, the national championship that you, you referenced, uh, where were you when you learned about that? What kind of a thrill was that for you as somebody who's worn the uniform? Well, it was a great thrill because finally we could not stop taking grief from Boston College guys and Boston University guys. Um, but I think, you know, for – I mean, I played the first game at Schneider Arena that was played there in the fall of 1973. And we literally, they were pouring the floor. Like the while we were skating, we were skating at North Smithfield and at Brown and at the Providence Civic Center, wherever we could get ice, we practiced. And they were literally, we would come back and run down a rink and see how it was coming along. So they put in all the, the cooling system in the floor and then they poured the concrete. I remember seeing Lou out there in rubber boots watching them pour the floor. And um, we didn't know if we'd be able to play that first game. We played the University of Pennsylvania and we won one nothing. Danny Kennedy scored, I'm pretty sure. But we didn't know if we'd be able to play. Like, even the day before we played, they were just putting down the ice. And the first time we went out to skate, big chunks of ice were coming out. And, but we had managed to play and then, of course, helped participate in the rink refurbishment a couple of years ago. They did a great job. And um, that, that was a great thrill to, to play in the first game there and play on campus all those years. It was fun. And in 2015, you were at Calgary then waiting, presumably with open arms for John Gillies, the uh, prior yes. goaltender. Yeah. Tell, tell me I'm wrong about this. He's one of the 10 best players ever to wear the Friar uniform. I would say true? so. He hasn't found his way just yet as a pro goalie, and I'm not sure if he will, but he was a dominating player at Providence College. I mean, you know, the best, the best player that I've ever seen at Providence was Ron Wilson. And I think the reason you can say that that with some confidence is even today with all these kids that play 40 games, we only played 28. He's still in the top 10 in scoring in NCAA history. So I think Ronnie was great. I think, uh, you know, I think you get in there with, uh, you mentioned Scott Klein endorsed. I think I'd put him in that group. Randy Belichick probably, uh, Chris Terreri. But for sure, I, I would put John in the top 10. You're in my era there, Brian. I like that <laughs> with those yeah. guys, Scott and Kurt Klang, or Scott. Scott uh, unfortunately died recently too. That's right. I heard that. I he, talked to Kurt. He would rest in peace. Um, and with uh, with respect to John Gillies, if you have any doubt about how great he was, just rewatch the last minute of that championship yeah. game a few times. I've seen it a thousand times. Unbelievable. Each time, so save after save. Uh, it was fun. How about if we play a quick round of hashtag Ask Berkey? Sure. Quick, this your Twitter feed, which is, by the way, a, a, a must follow for hockey fans on Twitter. But every once in a while, Brian does a, an Ask Berkey, uh, which uh, people throw things at him. I've got five, five quick kind of lightning round things, Brian, then we'll let you go. Other than Ron Wilson, who was the best Friar teammate that you had? Other than Ron Wilson, the best Friar teammate that I played with. Um, ooh, I would say... The best athlete was John McMorrow, but he got hurt every year. So he never, he was a high pick with the New York Rangers back when they didn't draft college kids, but he got hurt every year and never really lived up to his potential. Um, a guy that I really enjoyed playing with was Dave Kelly, who was captain when I was my second year. And he was a big, tough right winger and scored a lot of goals. And he was a, he was a guy that I really looked up to as a player. And then one year ahead of me, a real special player was Dan Kennedy who was a fantastic hockey player and a good student. I really tried to model myself after him. He was kind of my idol when I was playing as a sophomore and a junior. Who were the Friars' biggest rivals when you were playing at PC? Boston College, no question. Brown and Boston College. Brown, 
we hated Brown. When I was a freshman, they they didn't uh, they still didn't let freshmen play. So Ronnie Wilson and I were in the first or maybe second class, I think the first, of where freshmen were allowed to play. So we played four years. And I graduated with the record for games played at Providence College. It's the only record Ronnie didn't have. And it was, of course, every kid that's played since has gone by by 20 to 80 games because they played so many more games. But um, the big rival was, you know, the Dominican priests would be like, we don't care if you win any games this year as long as you beat Boston College. And those games were really crude, really rough games. Like, we hated each other. It was, those games were always really dirty. What was the impact of your cohort, the guys that you played with and around? And I mean this obviously in the context of the miracle on ice. So the impact of your cohort on the development of the game in the United States? Well, it was interesting. I think I played against 13 of those guys. So I had an interesting dichotomy because I played at Providence College, but I went home in the Minnesota for the summer. And we played in the college uh, uh, summer league with all the top college players from all over the country. So if you were from Minnesota, even if you went to Colorado College or Denver, you came back for the summer. We all played in the same league. And it was a really good league. There's like 20 NHL guys that played more than that, probably 30, that I played with or against. So I played against a lot of the Robbie McClanahan and a lot of guys that were on that miracle team, Steve Kristoff. I played against him in summer hockey. And then I played against all the kids from BU, like Michael Ruzioni, Dave Still, Jackie O'Callaghan, all those guys. So I knew or played against about 13 of those guys. And that miracle on ice in 1980 was such a galvanizing thing. And it, it jet propelled USA hockey, or hockey in the USA and USA hockey, which is the national governing body. It jet propelled that. I mean, in my lifetime, it's the biggest single in impact incident uh, event that happened in hockey that propelled hockey. The second would be the Gretzky trade. When he got traded to Los Angeles, that helped hockey in the U.S. a lot. And what a lot of people don't realize is one of the biggest factors in the expansion of hockey around the U.S. has been the existence of minor league hockey. So wherever you have an American hockey league team or an East Coast hockey league team, youth hockey springs up around it. And so we have like I remember going to a game at Providence and seeing three scholarship kids from Texas, for God's sake, Texas. When I was at Providence, you never saw anyone from Texas. So to me, uh, that 1980 team had no idea the impact they were going to have on the hockey world south of the 49th parallel, but it was staggering. As an aside, we'll get back to our list in a second. Did you have a, a professional relationship at any point in time with Herb Brooks? Yeah. Herb Brooks, Herb Brooks, I actually got to be pretty good friends with Herb Brooks and, and um, he didn't recruit me. And I saw him after a summer league game and I'd had a really good game and he came up to me and said, you know, letting you go to school out of state was, was a big mistake. And I said, Hey, Herb, you never even spoke to me. Don't give me that garbage. Uh, he was a great guy. And um, he used to stack. There was a guy named Mr. Carlson that ran the summer league. Herbie used to stack his teams in the summer league. So there'd be like eight or nine golfers playing on the same team and they won the championship every year. So the one year we beat them and I saw Herb afterwards and I said, who does that? Who stacks the team in the summer league? And he put his arm around me and he goes, Berkey, always take the edge. <laughs> he was a great guy. He won three national titles in eight years at the University of Minnesota. Just staggering. Yeah, think of that, right? That's, yeah. that's really something. If you could change one thing about the pro game, what would it be? I would play fewer games. I think 82 games is too many, and I think the product suffers some nights. I think there's too many good players missing games. Uh, and I've been saying this since I worked at the NHL back in 1993. I remember Gary Bettman said to me the first week on the job, what's one thing I can do to make the game dramatically better? He said, play fewer games. He goes, well, we can't do that. I said, I know, but you asked him. So um, – no, we, we play too many games. If we could get it, the, the game is fantastic, but if we could get it down to 70 games or 72 games, I think it would be much better. What's your second favorite sport? Rugby. I played rugby when I was in law school and for my first two years practicing law. I played for the Harvard Business School Rugby Football Club, and I loved it. And I'm on the board of Rugby Canada, so it's, I love rugby. It's a great game. Awesome, Bob. 
Well, Brian, this has been fun. The book is Burke's Law, A Life in Hockey, due out in October. And again, the pre-order information will be in the show notes. Uh, Brian Burke, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, this has been uh, a, a lot of fun for me to talk about hockey in the middle of the summer with, with a great expert and a great friar. Uh, maybe we could catch up again sometime. That would be fun if you wouldn't I, mind. I would like that. Thank you, Joe. All right, Brian. Thanks very much and best wishes. Take care. Thank you.